A lot of people, they think neural networks are only good for classifying objects. And I'm here to expand your mind with autoencoders, one of my favorite kinds of neural networks that I think don't get enough love. Students always want to talk to me about generative adversarial networks, and those are super cool too, but I think it's best to start with autoencoders. Autoencoders are a way to make neural networks summarize the information that they're looking at. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with something, say an image, but it could be something else. And then we're going to force the neural net to describe it in a small set of numbers. And then we're going to have the neural net actually try to output the same thing. So it's almost as though I look at a picture of someone and I try to describe it to a friend in 16 words, and then they have to draw that same person. I'm going to have to really distill what I'm seeing in that person. I'm going to have to pick the best adjectives for them. In the same way, we're going to make the neural net do that to another neural net, but the way neural nets pass information around is with numbers. So this is useful, one, for compression. We can actually build these awesome compression algorithms that are very specific to a domain. But it's also useful for doing things like denoising, right? Because if I saw a grainy image of a friend and I described it to someone, you can imagine that my friend might draw that person with the graininess removed. So we can actually build these incredibly powerful denoising filters using the same neural net technology. So first of all, you need to have my GitHub repository checked out. So if you haven't done it already, clone lucas slash ml dash class. And go into the directory videos slash autoencoder. Now, you should probably do wnb init to create a new project. And lastly, open up autoencoder.py. So most of my code should be familiar to you if you've watched my first video on perceptrons. Basically, we're building a perceptron with a twist. The input and the output to this perceptron is the same. The model is going to take an image, flatten it, and run a dense array of perceptrons on it. But then it's going to run another array of perceptrons with the outputs equal to the size of the original image. Then we're going to reshape the output into the form of the original image. We're going to run our gradient descent with a loss function that's the difference between the pixels in our input image and the output image. In this case, a mean squared error loss function actually makes a lot of sense, but you can certainly try others. If the hidden layer in blue is large, the network should easily be able to recreate the input image. But if the hidden layer in blue is small, then the network will have to use these digits as efficiently as possible to pass the essence of the original image to the output layer to recreate it. One use case of this type of structure could be compression. Gradient descent will hopefully get the network to compress these digits into the smallest possible space. We could save each image with the layers that reduce the image down to the middle layer, and then we could decompress the image with the layers that expand out the image from the middle layer. We can also use variations of this approach to generate synthetic images and remove noise from images in various ways. Let's crank through the code. Line 13 sets the size of that middle encoding layer. I'm trying the number 32 here, but feel free to experiment with other numbers because this is the most important variable in the autoencoder. Line 16 loads in the MNIST data. This is the digit data that we keep working with. We only load x underscore train and x underscore test, the pixel values of the numbers, and we don't actually load the labels of the images because we don't actually need the labels of the images for what we're about to do. Lines 18 and 19 normalize the data to be between 0 and 1, which is generally best practice for all neural nets. Line 21 sets up our network. First, we flatten out the data. Then we compress it into 32 values using a ReLU activation function since we're in the middle of the model. Then we expand our model with another dense layer with 28 times 28 outputs, the same size as the original layer. Quick understanding check. Can you guess how many free parameters our model has? If we have trouble guessing or we want to check our understanding, we can run model.summary to make sure we know exactly what's going on. And then we call model.fit to really train this model. Now, we pass in x underscore train, 
both as the input and the output of this model. Finally, we call model.save to save the model as a file so that we can test it on more data. Boom. Look at this one run. It's going to be nuts. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, my god. OK. OK, and look at this. The image on the left is the original image, and the input on the right is the output image. And you can see that the model has really distilled the essence of these large images, or 28 by 28 images, into just 32 numbers. The image on the right might be a little bit more blurry than the input image, and it might remove artifacts that would be really unusual for that particular digit. Let's test our autoencoder and see how well it performs. I wrote some code for you in run underscore autoencoder.py that you can use to see how well this image encoding works. The first couple lines load in some libraries in our data. OpenCV is just a library for manipulating images in lots of ways. It can be a little frustrating, but if you're working with images, you probably need to learn to love it. The next few lines set up a loop where we wait for keyboard input. I load the images in one at a time, and then I show you the input image. If you press spacebar, I actually add some noise to the input image, and then I call model.predict. Keras's predict function always runs in batch, but I want to call it on one single image, so I need to reshape the input image into one 28 by 28 list. Then it returns an array of output, but in my case, since I only fed it one image, I only get one image in my output. That image is 28 by 28, but I need to reshape it to add a color channel so CV2 will show it to me. Let's give this a try. Here are my inputs on the left and my outputs on the right. And as I go through, my output looks something like my input, but it's much less impressive than I saw earlier. So where did I make my mistake? Can you spot it? This one actually took me a little while to debug. So the first thing I do when I see something like this is I go back to the original training, and I look at how well it was working on the training data. So in this case, I can go into WNB, and I can see that on my training data, the input image and the output image were much more similar than when I'm running this thing potentially in production. So when inference is happening differently in production than in training, the first place that I look is in the data preparation. There's really only one step of data preparation that we do here, and that is dividing our input data by 255. And sure enough, we forgot to divide our data in our production code by 255. And unfortunately, instead of throwing an error, our model silently gave us degraded performance. So let's add back in that normalization. And sure enough, our model now works great. In fact, it seems to smooth the image out a bit, which might make you wonder if this model is good at denoising. So if we go in, we can actually add a function which changes things. So when I press the space bar, it makes a whole bunch of pixel noise. Now I'm running my autoencoder on input with pixel noise. And you can see that with pixel noise, our model's doing an excellent job of removing it. This is because the autoencoder has a much harder time encoding the pixel noise than encoding the original image. So if we want to make an even better denoiser, we can programmatically add noises to our image at training time and use that as input. So here, input is a noisy version of our original image, and the output is the original image itself. So take a look at denoising autoencoder, which does this. So here we load x train and x test again, but now we run that function add noise, 
which creates versions of Xtrain and Xtest with pixel noise added. We can use an identical architecture to before, and we've built a system that automatically filters out all types of noise. But what are neural nets without convolutions? Let's apply the convolutional nets from previous videos to both these examples. Open up autoencoder underscore cnn.py, and this is a lot like autoencoder.py, but I've changed the architecture to be convolutional. Just like in the convolutional neural nets video, I need to reshape my data to 28 by 28 by 1 to work with the conv 2D layers in Keras. I make a convolutional layer. I use a special padding equals same, so the input and output shape of my convolution is the same. Without this, the output images would be slightly smaller than the inputs. Then I do max pooling to reduce the size. I do another convolutional layer, and then I add an upsampling layer, which actually just repeats the rows and columns to make the image twice as big. I add one more convolution layer, and this one has just a single output to match the shape of my original input image. This network takes a long time to train, but it works fantastically well with a very small number of parameters. So this is kind of awesome, right? So we've built a denoising system and we've built a custom compression system with stuff that we already understood and frameworks that we already knew without changing very much. I think that's a pretty cool application of neural networks but I think there's even a bigger point here, which is that I've seen when students first encounter autoencoders, it really opens their minds to lots and lots of new applications of neural networks that they hadn't thought of before. You really understand that what neural networks do is they basically take fixed sets of inputs and then output fixed sets of numbers. And I think that's a really important thing to understand where neural networks could be implied, especially things like colorizing images or generative adversarial networks, which I know we have to do a video on in the future. So as a fun challenge from here, you could try to build a convolutional system for that same um, denoising thing that we built earlier without convolutions. I think that would be super educational. I hope that you had fun learning about autoencoders. I think they're incredibly applied in some ways. We built a system that can do custom compression on very specific data sets. We also built a system almost at the same time that could do a very robust type of denoising that could have practical applications on image processing or video processing or even audio processing. The next step that probably most of you are interested in is learning more about generative adversarial networks, which this stuff applies super well to. So we're going to make that video soon, and I'll see you there. OK, guys, if you like these videos, here's what you could do for me. It's so easy. Subscribe, write a comment but not a mean comment. <laughs> <laughs>